Welcome to this week's Parsha Shir. We're going to be talking about Parsha Shlach Lecha. I found a beautiful, in fact, I didn't find it. Someone sent it to me and I read through it. It's a beautiful Likuti Sichas from the late Lubavitcher Rebbe. It's absolutely magnificent. It addresses two questions which are fundamental questions about the story of the Miraglim, the spies who were sent by Moshe Rabbeinu to spy out, to see the lay of the land in Eretz Canaan before the Jewish people went there. We know that it was an abortive mission because when they came back, that what they said resulted in a 40-year um, sojourn in the wilderness for Moshe Rabbeinu and the rest of the Jewish people. But there's two fundamental questions in the lead-up to the story. That means in the, in the initial stages of the story, when Moshe Rabbeinu decided to send the Jewish um, spies to Eretz Canaan, how he did and what he did. So we're going to look at the Likuta Sichas and hopefully we'll be able to gain so much from it. Says the Lubavitch Rebbe, Legabe HaKosub Parsha Seinu, the Posuk says as follows, Vayikra Moshe lo Hoshea binun Yehoshua. There's a strange kind of um, insertion at the beginning of the story of the Miraglim, where Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, changes the name of his primary disciple, Yehoshua, who had been uh, known as Hoshea. He had no, that was his name. His name was Hoshea. He changed his name to Yehoshua. How exactly is this relevant to the story of the Miraglim? It's not made clear in the text of the parsha, but the Gemara explains it. Nemabe Gemara, the Gemara says it's a Gemara in Soita Daflamadal. In fact, the Gemara there in Soita deals quite extensively, um, quotes a number of different Agadatas, Medroshim, essentially, about the story of the Miraglim. And one of the Agadatas, one of the Medroshim that we see there is about this particular aspect of the story, why was Yehoshua's name changed? Why was he initially, originally known as Hoshea, and why was his name now changed, particularly at this point in time, to Yehoshua by Moshe Rabbeinu? She Moshe Rabbeinu Hispalel says the Gemara that this was a, an indication of a prayer that Moshe Rabbeinu davened. What did he say? Ka Yehoshiacha me'atzas meraglim. So his name had been Hoshea. Now the added Yud makes the first two letters Ka, Yud He, which is the name of Hashem. God should save you from the advice, from the information that's given to you, from whatever it is, the Miraglim, the rest of the spies, your, your colleagues on this mission are going to try and get you to do. You should be saved there and you shouldn't fall into the trap that they fall into. That's what the Gemara seems to indicate is the reason behind the change of name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. Ko Yehoshiach HaMeyatas Meraglim. Yesh Lehovin says the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a question which we all have. We know that the Meraglim at this stage were absolutely pure. They were good people. They were tzaddikim. They were anoshim. They were considered fine, upstanding people. They were leaders. They were mentors. They were principal individuals within the Jewish nation framework. And if that's the case, we have to say that that's the case. Why? Shem loy came because if it wouldn't be the case, after all, Moshe Rabbeinu was the one that was sending them. He wouldn't have agreed. He wouldn't have conceded to them going as representatives of the Jewish people, as the spies who were going to see the lay of the land, had they not been people who were appropriate for that job. We know that it was Moshe who made the decision. How do we know that it was Moshe who made the decision as to sending the Miraglim? Because, Kanemar, Shalach Lecha. We know that Rashi says, quoting a Medrash, send Lecha. What does it mean, Lecha? Ledatcha. This is up to you, Moshe Rabbeinu. Even though God had some input as to what it was the Miraglim should do, nevertheless, it was up to Moshe Rabbeinu to decide who the Miraglim were going to be. And that being the case, he must have chosen good people. He wouldn't have chosen bad people. 
In which case, l'shema im kain hispalel koyosh yachmet sasreg meraglim. Why would Moshe Rabbeinu have prayed for um, Yehoshua, Hoshea at that stage, change his name to Yehoshua? Why would he have been concerned for the outcome if the people he was sending Yehoshua with were utterly reliable in every possible sense? Why would he need to change Yehoshua's name to protect him from the atzas meraglim? That's question number one. It's a standard question. Question number two is as follows. The imna niach shelamrois kashekshirim hoyu. And if you're going to suggest that despite the fact that they were kosher and they, these were good people, that the Meraglim were wonderful, upstanding members of the Jewish nation. That Moshe Rabbeinu somehow um, thought to himself, you know what, they're good people now, but they're going to go to Canaan and they're going to somehow see something which is inappropriate and they're going to come back and they're going to have been affected by that experience and things are not going to work out good. If that was the case, if Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned for the outcome of this mission, even though at this stage these people were good people, and that's why he prayed for Yehoshua, he wanted Yehoshua to, to be protected from any of the outcome that could occur as a result of who the Meraglim were, of who these um, uh, other ten people, well, we know Kolev, and Kolev is not going to be the subject of today's shear, but besides for Kolev and Yeshua, the other ten turned out to be bad, but if he was somehow concerned that the Miraglim as a whole were going to be affected by the experience of going on this mission, Bilti Muvin Lefizet makes no sense whatsoever, why did Moshe Rabbeinu only change Yeshua's name? He should have changed everybody's name. He should have made sure that each and every one of them was protected via the prayer. By the way, this is a whole discussion in and of itself. Does prayer help to protect people from committing sin? It's not the subject of today's share either. That also is an interesting discussion. Can we daven for somebody that Hashem should help them keep Shabbos? not be Mechal Shabbos. Is that something that one can do? Is that something that we can invest in? I'm not going to give you the whole share, but the bottom line is we can daven that Hashem helps people be in circumstances that Chil Shabbos is not something that they are necessarily interested in. That we can do. So we can daven to Hashem not to put people in circumstances where they may commit an Avero, they may do a sin. However, the question really is, if Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned that the mission's outcome was endangered, somehow in jeopardy because of what would happen in Eretz Canaan, why was he only concerned about Yehoshua and not about everybody else? So those two questions are going to underpin today's shir, and they really form the basis of the discussion here in the Likute Sichus. It's a beautiful piece. Nema Bigmar. The Gemara says, and this Gemara is in Shabbos, Tav Kufhei, Omid Beis. Kach umenusoi shal Yetzara. How does the Yetzara work? What, is exa what exactly does the Yetzara do to get people to do an Avera? You know that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I debated Dennis Prager. I debated him, but you can do a Google search online. You can watch it on YouTube. You can listen to it on SoundCloud. Fascinating debate. And the subject was, are humans inherently good. What does that mean? That means are we born, is our basis, is our foundation inherently good and we go wrong or are we born bad and we need to correct the bad? My a thesis and it's based on countless sources within, um, within the Hashkofa, within the theology of Judaism is that people are born B'Tselem Eloikim and this is absolutely backed up by countless sources that human beings want to do the right thing. We want to be Oiv de Hashem. Anushama is pushing us to do the right thing. In which case, we have a question. How is it that anybody does an Avera? How is it that anybody falls into the trap of the Yetzirah? So the Lubavitcher Rebbe quotes this Gemara. It's a famous Gemara in Shabbos Taf Kufhei. Tach umenusse shel How does the Yetzirah work? What does the Yetzirah do? Hayoim oimer loy so this is a Bryce in the name of Rabbi Yochanan Ben-Nuri. 
you can look it up. It's a fascinating Gemara. It says that somebody who loses his temper and gets angry, it's as if he's an Oved Avoid Zora. Says the Gemara, what, what are you talking about? How can you say that somebody who gets angry, who loses their temper, loses their rag, that they are an Oved Avoid Zora? It says that's, it, it's, it's a kind of steady drip, drip effect of the Yetzirah. It doesn't start off that you become an idol worshipping pagan. That's not how it begins. First of all, the Yetzirah says, do this. Then the Yetzirah says, do that. Uh, and Hagemora miskavenes lahaz be'echi tochen shi'yehudi yavoy avera. The Gemara wants to tell us how it's possible that a, a Jewish person who is essentially good and wants to do avoid us Hashem, who wants to be an Evet Hashem, wants to be a servant of God, how is it possible that that person should do bad? Do you know how? Yehudi mi b'nei Avram Yitzchak v'yakai v'boi neshoma. We're talking about a Jew who is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has within them, a neshoma has within them, the power to be a tzelem elokim, they are a tzelem elokim. That's how they were created. Neshama shenasata bitahirahi. The neshama that you Hashem gave me is utterly pure. Ata barasa, you created it. Ata yatsarta, you formed it. Ata nafachta biv ata mashamra bekirbi. Every aspect of the human condition is totally enabled, is animated by our connection our close connection to Hashem. So how is it possible that any of us ever do an Avera? Echi tochen shiyavar hu al tzivoy b'eroi, says the Gemara, al kach o'imeres ha-gemara she-kach hi u-menusoy shal How does the Yetzirah work? The Yetzirah works very simply. It works on the basis that first it tells you to do something which is innocuous, and then it sort of slowly progresses. The thing doesn't happen in one go. It happens slowly but surely. Eventually, you become an Oved Avod You start off as a tzaddik. You start off as a wonderful uh, neshama that was created, that is a yitzir of Hashem, and you end up as a balavera. It gives the, the uh, Likute Sichas Lebavit Shereb gives a wonderful example. The mitzvah is yesh inyan shal hidur mitzvah. We know that every mitzvah can be performed in the best possible way. We can do a mitzvah, we can do it wonderfully. We can invest so much of ourselves into every mitzvah that we do. Shabbos, Yom Tov, Gemilas Chasodim, uh, you know, all the ritual mitzvahs, every aspect of our lives. We can invest so much energy to make sure there's hidur mitzvah, that the mitzvah is the most beautiful way that we can conduct that particular mitzvah. Kein yitochein, so now which explains, kefishenema gemurashi, kaim odom esa mitzvahs, uvechol zois loi yotza yedecha vaseh. Gemara says a very interesting thing. A person could do a mitzvah and still didn't discharge their duty. A person can do a mitzvah and didn't discharge their duty. They did the mitzvah, right? So how can you not discharge your duty? So the Bavit Rebbe explained, it's beautiful. So you want to do a mitzvah, and the first thing is the Yetzirah tells you as follows. You could do this mitzvah. Uh, let's, let's talk about a mitzvah we're all familiar with uh, in in relative terms, to do with Hidur, and that is the mitzvah of buying the most beautiful estrig. So you want to, you go to the, it's before Sukkot, you want to buy an estrig, and you go to the Meicha uh, Estrigim, you go to the person who sells Estrigim, and you see all different type of Estrigim. You don't know much about Estrigim, there may be an expert there who's giving you information. You look at the different prices, there's a $25 table, there's a $50 table, there's a $100 table, you think to yourself, you know what, I really want to buy a most beautiful estrig this year. Suddenly, there's a, 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 a knock at your door. There's a little voice in your head that says, are you crazy? What's the difference? Which type of estrig you buy? It's a kosher estrig. Buy a kosher estrig for $25. You, know, you want to go completely overboard, buy one for $50. Why would you want to buy a $100 estrig? That's how the Yates Horror works. It's like a niggling little voice, the back of your head telling you, don't do the Hidda Mitzvah. Don't go all the way. You don't need to go all the way. You can buy a less expensive estrog. It's going to be completely fine. You're still going to be Yoitze in your Mitzvah. 
Why do you need to buy the most beautiful thing? Why do you need to invest all of that energy, that money, that time into doing this mitzvah? You could invest less, less and still do the mitzvah. Kiem is a mitzvah stam. Just do it. Stam. You just you've done the mitzvah. You don't have to do it in the best possible way. You've still done the mitzvah. Then, the, so you, you've already agreed to that. You say, you know what? I'm not going to do it in the best possible way. I'm going to do it in the sort of average way. I'm going to make sure I do the mitzvah, but I don't have to do it in the best possible way. Then the Yitzhara says to you, listen. You could do the mitzvah. You could get away with it. For example, Shabbos. There's different ways of keeping Shabbos. You can bring in Shabbos early. You can take out Shabbos late. Or you can bring in Shabbos late and take out Shabbos early. Or there's a sort of halfway house. You could bring in Shabbos on time and take out Shabbos on time. So it starts off that you want to bring in Shabbos early. The Yitzhara says, yeah, what's the devil? You need an extra 18 minutes for. It's not so important. Why not just bring in Shabbos exactly on Shkia? All right, so usually you would bring in Shabbos on the time that is in the calendar, which is 18 minutes before, whichever minhag you have. Some it's 20 minutes before in Yushalayim, it's 40 minutes before, whatever it is. You bring in Shabbos um, a bit later. Well, it's not a big deal. It's before Shkia, it's fine. Okay. Then the Yetzirah said, once you've started doing that, you already got used to bringing Shabbos a bit later than it says on the calendar. The Yetzirah says to you, you know what? You don't have to bring in Shabbos at Shkia because Le Maisa between Shkia and Tzeis HaKoychovim, between, uh, between sunset and nightfall, in any event, it's only Drabonon. Big deal. What's so important? You don't have to bring in Shabbos at Shkia. You can wait a few minutes. Nothing's going to happen. It's all okay. That's how the Yetzirah works. It's incremental. It doesn't start off by telling you that you should be an Oyed Avoid Zorah. It starts off by telling you that don't take mitzvahs so seriously. You don't have to be the biggest tzaddik. There's other people who are bigger tzaddikim than you. Let them do it according to the way the tzaddik does it. Eventually, the Yetzirah will find a pischoin pair, will find a, a little chink in your armor that will allow you, uh, him to convince you, allow the Yetzirah to convince you that you don't need to observe the mitzvah at all and actually to be over an Isur. That's what the Gemara means. The Gemara means that you begin, it begins by saying that you, uh, uh, you don't need to keep the mitzvah in the best possible way and by the end of it, as it progresses, it will tell you you don't have to keep the mitzvahs at all. In fact, you can be an over avera. You can do averas. Im kachu hadover legabekol mitzvah protis. If that's the situation with each individual mitzvah, we spoke about Esrog, we spoke about Shabbos. This, now we're going to make a general rule. Shakala kelishihi be mitzvah gereras achareha avera al isur. If you take mitzvahs less seriously, if you're a person who takes mitzvahs less seriously, inevitably you will end up doing averas. Gereras achare avera avera al isur. Kosher came be mitzvahs ahavas Yisrael. And even more so when it comes to the mitzvah of ahavas Yisrael. Do you know what the most important mitzvah is? It's not my idea. Rabbi Kiva says it. The most important mitzvah is Yesoid Kol HaMitzvah. This is here in Likuti Sichas. It is the foundation of every mitzvah. Do you know what it is? It says it in Yerushalmi. See in Yerushalmi, Nadorim Amar Rabbi Akiva, V'ahavta L'reacha Kamoicha Ze Klal Godol Batoira. Do you know what the most important mitzvah is? The foundation of every mitzvah? Is the love, the boundless love that you have for every other Jewish person, for every other person who is a part of your faith community. Somebody who is disregarding of this mitzvah doesn't think it's that important. If you don't care so much for another Jew, you say, no, I don't have to, lo- I can love the Jews who are like me. You know, I heard once from someone, you know what means? You should only love Jews who are kamoicha. You only love Jews who are exactly like you. It's a very small community. It's just the people in your street, in your shtibel, in your shul. 
But anyone who's not, I don't have to love. No, no, that's not what it means. Kameicha means you have to love every other Jew. You have to find common ground with every other Jewish person so that you can feel positively towards them, so you can feel fondly towards them, that you can work together in bringing the Geula Shalema and bringing Mashiach. That's the idea, that we have to find the nationhood, we have to find the common ground. Because you know what? If you find reasons not to have common ground with another Jew, you know what's going to end up happening? You're going to end up hating them. That's what it means. That's what the Gemara in Shabbos, Daf Kufhei means. It begins with slowly but surely, just telling you, is only those who are, who are showing me Torah mitzvahs exactly like you. That's who you have to like. Anyone who's not exactly like you, you don't have to like. <laughs> what's going to happen? It's going to end up you hate everyone in your shul as well. That's what's going to happen. The Gemara. The Gemara tells a story. It's a famous story. The Gemara can be found in Shabbos, Daf Lamed Aleph, Omed Aleph, by the way, I noted in the footnotes of Likuta Sichus, it's whoever wrote those footnotes. It says Lamadalaf Omad Beis. That's wrong. It's Daf Lamadalaf Omad Aleph. The Gemara says about Shammai, a ger, somebody who wanted to convert to Judaism, came to Shammai. You know who Shammai was? Shammai was one of the greatest rabbis in the period of the uh, second Beis Amikdosh. He was the founding father of a yeshiva known as Beis Shammai. His rebbe was Hillel. Of course, he founded the yeshiva called Beis Hillel, which eventually dominated. And Beis Hillel, uh, uh, Hillel was the grandfather, great-grandfather, a bit more than that, of Rabban Gamliel, who had the Sanhedrin in, in Yavne. But these two great figures, Hillel and Shammai, were the, were the uh, founts of, of spiritual energy for the Jewish people. And they were so great that I'm sure they had all kinds of people coming to visit them. One day, a ger, a prospective convert, came to visit Shammai in his, in his house. You know, Shammai was, a, was by trade, he was a builder, he was a contractor. You're going to see, it's, it's relevant to the story. So this ger, this prospective convert, said to Shammai, Please teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot whether he meant it literally or whether he meant it uh, um, kind of figuratively, quickly, I need to learn the whole Torah because I want to convert. I don't want to have to wait a long time until I become a convert to Judaism. Please, I need to learn Torah right away. I'll spend half an hour with you. Tell me what it is that you can teach me and I want to become Jewish. What happened? So the uh, Gemara says, You know, he was a, he was a builder. So he had with him a measuring stick, some type of um, stick that has a particular measurement, whether it was a foot or a yard or whatever it was, a, a meter. And this stick was in his hand. He got so angry with this request, so it sounds from the Gemara, that he took the stick and he pushed him away. He pushed this ger, this prospective convert, away with the stick. All right. So he went from there, this guy, this ger, he went to Hillel, who's the other great rabbi in town. And it Keshebole Hillel, says the Gemara, Omalo Hillel, Hillel said to him, Not a problem. You want to learn Torah, Regal Achas? Da'aloch snei, that which you don't like, Lechavroch loisavid. Don't do to your friend. In other words, how do you like to be treated? That's how you should treat other people. That's the Torah on one foot. The Idoch Pirushahu. And everything else is just explanation. It's just commentary. That's what Hillel said to him. He said, you know, you can put your foot down. You've learned the whole Torah. Now go and learn the commentary and you can become a ger. All right. That's the difference between Shammai and Hillel. The Kosher says, the Likute Sichas, the Lubavitcher Rebbe says, Me'achar b'chein Omar Hillel. If you're going to say that this was the answer that Hillel gave, I mean, Hillel didn't know more or less than Shammai. I know that Shammai was his Talmud, but Shammai is considered the equal of Hillel. If that's the case, and this must be a fact. It's not something that Hillel made up that Shammai didn't know. It's not as if he was innovative in this particular respect. And that being the case, Why didn't Shammai come up with the same answer? 
Why is it that only Hillel came up with that answer? Why did Shammai take the stick and poke him? And Hillel said, it's okay, what, you know, you, you should be a good person because you're going to be good to people like you want people to be good to you. And the rest is commentary. Where's this difference coming from? Because they both understood each other. They understood the Torah. These were the greatest rabbis of the time. What is this Gemara telling us? What do these two opinions represent in terms of an approach to God and a, an approach to Judaism? Elo says the Likutei Sichus as follows. When it comes to the way great people behave, the greatest, most righteous people of our generation, the people we refer to as tzaddikim, there's two different ways. There's two different approaches. What are they? There's one way, there's one approach, which is the approach of tzaddikim as they are themselves. They are paradigms of perfection. They are people who work them on themselves constantly. They're totally elevated. They're completely removed. And they are oblivious to the attractions of the physical, material world. That's their certain type of tzaddikim that are separated from the realities of the world in which we inhabit, okay? As he puts it as follows. Hanhoga shall kav hagvurois. It's a kav hagvurois. It's the the energy of the power, the strength. This tzaddik is so strong in his tzidkus. What does that mean? She'en yonon ha'alo'o. Their only interest is elevation, self-elevation, to be better, to be on a higher level today than I was yesterday. They're not interested in the gashmias of olam hazeh. It, has, it plays no role in the day-to-day -day life of a tzaddik, of such a tzaddik, right? That's what it is. Everything they do, even if they're using Gashmi's things, listen, everybody needs to eat, everybody needs to sleep, everybody needs to take care of themselves, live in a house, whatever it is. But everything that they do that's of consequence in their lives is totally infused. In fact, it's overwhelmed by spirituality. It's not based in physical, material pleasure or in, even in any kind of benefit from the physical, material world in the sense that that's what the focus is. Dugmas harashbi be'es heyoyse b'mara. The Gemara in Shabbos, you know the Gemara in Shabbos, uh, it's in Lama Gimel Omad Beis, talks about Reb Shem Vayoychai. He kept on teaching Torah and the Romans were very angry and he had to go run away with his son and he lived in a cave and he lived there for 12 years, completely porous from Olam Hazed, nothing to do with anything physical or material. That's Reb Shimon Bayechai. He is, of course, the foundational figure of Kabbalah, of, of, the, of the mystical Jewish uh, scene. That's what we understand. Rabbi Shem Bayechai didn't have any part in the physical material world. And that's what it means to be Rabbi Shem Bayechai. Kav HaGavurais. That's the way the Lubavitch Rebbe presents it to us. Kolomar. Ein avoido zu shayeches leklal. Do you know what? This is not a general approach. It's not for everybody. This is a Rashbi approach. It's Rabbi Shem Bayechai. This is somebody who is at the height, the pinnacle, the uh, the um, most elevated level that one can be in terms of one spiritual approach. That's what it is. It's for tzaddikim, who even though they are here, as it were, lamata in the nether world, they are here in the physical realm. Nevertheless, they are as if they are in heaven. It's no different for them here or there. Their whole approach to life, their approach to God, their approach to everything is totally based on spirituality, aval legabi ha'olam, enoi tafes, eno tafes es mokon. This is not something which is for the wider world, for ordinary folk. That's not the way it's meant to be for ordinary people. Kedivrei Rashbi, and Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai himself says, "Evsha Adam Chayrish Vezerea Torah Matei Olel." For him, he saw world, the world in this way. Do you know what he he understood the world to be? It's a Gemara in Brachas Taflamadei. The Gemara says that 
that is it possible, said Rabbi Shem Bayechai, for a person to be a farmhand, to be someone who plows the field, who plants the field, and also leave room for studying Torah, for being a spiritual person, for being somebody who's close to Hashem? Is that even possible? He didn't understand it. Because he couldn't work that out, because that wasn't him. He was a tzaddik, totally removed from the world. The Gemara Masayemes, but the Gemara there says something very, very interesting. There were many people who tried to be like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but they couldn't do it. Do you know why? Because they weren't Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Only Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He could say it about himself, and in his particular world, in his bubble, that made sense. But in the broader context of society at large, that doesn't make any sense because people do have to be a chayrish v'zareah. They do have to be workers in the ordinary world to keep the world running, the physical world, the material world going. And in that sense, they can't be like Rabbi Shem Ba'echai. If everybody was like Rabbi Shem Ba'echai, there wouldn't be anything. There wouldn't be food to eat. There wouldn't be roads to walk on. There wouldn't be houses built because he, they just wouldn't. That's Rabbi Shem Ba'echai approach. That's one of the approaches of a tzaddik. Kach gam beishamai. Says the Likute Sichas, beautiful. He says, you know what? That explains the whole approach of beishamai. She'avoidosom v'hanogosom bekav ha'gvurois. You know beishamai was? They were aspirational to the highest degree. They were elevated. They felt you should always go for the best possible scenario, the strictest possible interpretation. They were machmirim on themselves because they felt that's the way to Hashem and that's what we have to do. They were exclusive in a sense. They weren't concerned with the wider world, with ordinary folk. They were concerned with Beishamai being the best that they can possibly be and that's what they were. La'atzmam ha'isazu derach toiva. However, this may have been a very good method in terms of their own elevation, in terms of their own avoidas Hashem, That's not for the ordinary world. That's not the way it works for everybody else. He, not everybody could keep the Hilchus Be Shammai and it would work for them. All that would happen is they would constantly be over Averis. They wouldn't be able to do that. And that's why Lefichach in Alocha Be Shammai. That's why we don't paskin like Be Shammai. That's why we don't decide halacha like Be Shammai. Because we couldn't have a society that was governed by the rules that were dictated by Be Shammai. Because really it was only about themselves. In their little cocoon it worked. But beyond it, it would never have worked. Be Shammai works. Be Shammai doesn't work. Lochain, lochain. Kesheboh ha'gele Shammai bekesh. Now we can understand that when the Ger, the convert, came to Shammai, and he says to him, I want to learn the whole Torah, everything that, that animates you in terms of your Torah, uh, your Torah focus. I need to learn it quickly. Tell me, tell me everything there is to know. Do you know what he did? He wanted to be like Shammai. In the Kavag Vurois, that's what he wanted to be. I want to be like you. Tell me quickly, how can I be like you? Shammai said to him, sorry, sorry, mate, that doesn't work. That's, that's not going to work. You're talking nonsense. You're never going to be like me, Aregel Achas. You want to convert to become Jewish, I understand. You're not going to be like Shammai. That's just not going to happen. And this is... This is a metaphor. He pushed him away with this measuring stick, this builder's stick. What is it? It's a measuring stick. It tells you that there's a, there's a measure and beyond that measure, whatever it is, is, you know, sometimes things you can measure something. You know, once I've measured it, I know that it's not possible, right? Everything has a measure. Everything has a restriction. Do you know what you are? If I measure you, Mr. Gare, you are limited in your abilities to become like Shammai. You're never going to be like me. He pushed him away by telling him there's a measure, there's a limitation, there's a restriction. Shabinyan Shammai. You can't be like Shammai. It's not going to happen. 
pushed him away, he said to him, that's not going to work. Don't waste your time. You're wasting your time here. All right, off he goes to Hillel. Hillel, he's got place for everybody because he's not like Shammai. He's created a different paradigm, a different way of expressing your spirituality, which is inclusive, inclusive even of those who don't aspire to the greatest of the great. They're not necessarily ready for the Shammai level. He's ready, doesn't have to be the Chofai. He doesn't have to push him away with an Amasabinyan because he doesn't see a limitation. You be the best that you can be at your level. I'll be the best that I can be at my level, but I want you to be included in my community. I want to be, you to be included in my group. Yisrael, how does he do it? Because if you have Havas Yisrael, if everybody loves everybody and sees the goodness in everybody and sees how everybody has something to contribute, whatever it is that their contribution may be, and it could be that in certain mitzvahs they're very lax, but essentially they're contributing to Jewish identity, to the sense of connectedness to Hashem in whatever it is that they do, the aspect of their Yiddishkeit that they are committed to. And there's some other aspects which they're not committed to. Unfortunately, they haven't got there yet. But they're part of the klal. They're part of the, the nation of Israel. Then it works. That's the derech of Hillel. Zoichim lechol Torah kula. They can be zoichet to the whole Torah. Because as part of the klal, you keep your mitzvah, I keep my mitzvah. So as long as we're all committed to mitzvahs, we're all committed to this common identity, this positive framework, this aspiration for a, uh, a, um, a goal that is oriented towards Hashem, even if it is not at this stage perfect in each and every one of us, nevertheless, it works. So Hillel didn't say, push him away, he said, whatever works for you, him works for you, Whatever you don't like, don't do to the other. In other words, it's an Indian of Klal Yisrael. It's an Indian of Klal Godal Batayra. Everything is included. Everybody has their part to play. That's the derech of Hillel. That's what Hillel has to offer. Shammai has his derech, and his derech has not got much kiyum, unfortunately. The only kiyum it has is that we know about it. But in terms of maintaining and sustaining the Jewish nation, Beis Shammai never survived. The only thing that survived was Beis Hillel, was this idea that the klal godel batayra, v'ahavta l'reacha kamecha, that which you do not want done to you, don't do to others. Don't be exclusive, be inclusive. Find ways of bringing people in, don't find ways of pushing people out. As the Zohar tells us, the Zohar is the foundational work of, of Kabbalism, of Jewish mysticism, authored originally by Reb Shimon Bar Yochai. And it talks there in this particular place, this part of the Zohar can be found. It's in Chelek Aleph Kvov. It's, uh, I, by the way, I didn't learn it. I'm only seeing it here in the footnotes of the Likute Sichus and the Likuta Sichas tells us that Zohar discusses the three great figures of the Torah, the three foundational figures of the Torah. Who are they? Noyach, Avraham, and Moshe Rabbeinu. Interesting, those three people. Each one of them lived in a generation which was very far from perfection. Let's be honest. Noach's generation was a total disaster. It was Malei uh, Chamas. Avram Avinu is in a generation which is a complete and utter disaster. They're all over Avay Dezara to the extent that he never heard about Hashem until he discovered Hashem for himself. Moshe Rabbeinu lives in a generation where the Jewish people have sunk to 49 levels of Tumah. That's the generation that he has to rescue from Mitzrayim and bring to Hasinai. It's a generation of the Midbar. Time after time, they got things wrong. These three leaders of each generation or foundational figures of their generation, that's what the Zohar discusses. And what does it say? Noach, Avram and Moshe, Vedorish al Noach, in the generation of Noach, Bishas Hamabal, when the flood 
was it wasn't there yet, but it was it was imminent. What happened? His Who did Noach daven for? Who did he pray for? Whose salvation was he seeking from God? Do you know who? Himself and his family. That's it. He wasn't interested in anybody else. What about everybody else, the entire generation? Thousand, hundred thousand, millions of people. We don't know how many people were alive then, but whoever it was, what did he what did he think of them? He didn't think about them at all. Didn't seem too concerned for their welfare. They came along to him and they said to him, Can you explain to us why you're building a teva? Would you mind explaining to us what it is that you're doing? He explained to them, you know what? Um, actually, Hashem is going to bring a mabble. It's going to be terrible. He's going to bring a mabble and it's going to be a disaster. You're all going to die. But he didn't do anything about it before. He never went to them. He didn't seem too concerned for them. In fact, we know it's called May Noach. The mabble has Noach's name attached to it. It's almost as if it's his fault. Even though he didn't do the Averis, he was saved. He is the father of future humanity. Somehow he's to blame for the fact that his generation wasn't saved. Avram? What about Avram Avinu? Abraham? He didn't wait until they came to him. There was people in his generation. He didn't wait for them. He went, he went over to them. He was somebody who spread the name of Hashem as far and as wide as he could. He went to everybody. He explained that there's a God and that we have to believe in Hashem. And Hashem directs our lives. And whatever it is that he told them, he made Ba'alei Tshuva. Lama is sois, but nevertheless, his bate avoidosoi vasias tzadikim. His only focus was he wanted to make tzadikim. He wasn't too interested in about any, in, in anybody else. He didn't concern himself with those people who didn't take any notice of his teachings, of his way of life. If they ignored him or rejected him, he left them and moved on. Never daven for somebody who wasn't a tzadik. We have a raya. We have a story in the Torah, the Shaz Gzera Sedoim, when Sedoim was a, is about to be destroyed. Hashem tells him, I'm going to destroy Sedoim and Amorah because they're all wicked people. He didn't daven that he shouldn't destroy Sedoim just because you shouldn't destroy it because they're human beings and we've got to give them a chance. He didn't talk about Teshuvah. He didn't create this model, we're going to see later, that Moshe Rabbeinu created. He said, but maybe there's a few tzaddikim. It would be a shame to destroy the city if there's included them in that city the citizens of Sodom who are tzaddikim, not concerned, as it were, for the rest of the city. When Hashem answered, you know what, there's not even ten tzaddikim in Sodom. Avram shavlim koimai. Avram went off and he said, you know what, forget it. Obviously, there's no chance for such people. They're all Rishoyim. They can all be destroyed and that's completely fine. What? What happened to the fact that humans have capabilities and abilities to be good? Why don't you care for them? Why aren't you trying to save them? Why are you allowing them to die? It's a big question, Avram Avinu. Shuvla Hishmiya Koltana, but he never said anything more to Hashem. He let them go. It's better than Noyach, but still he leaves something wanting in his approach. But when it comes to Moshe Rabbeinu, what an incredible force he was. He was a Roya Neman. He was an incredible shepherd. Do you know what Moshe Rabbeinu did? When the Jewish people sinned at the time of the Egel, he didn't say, you know, kill them all and I'll take over and my family would be okay, Shavit Levi, whatever it is. No. Everybody had to be forgiven. He created the concept of tshuva single-handedly, told Hashem, human beings have to have the capacity to repent and to do right by their wrongs and to do tshuva. Everybody, l'chol Yisrael, 
Gamler Shoim, even wicked people. The Lerak Shelo is Nag Kenoyach. Not only didn't he behave like Noyach, Shelo is Palerak Baad Atzmoi, that he, because Noyach only davened for himself. El Adar Abba, Moshe Rabbeinu Omar, Beim Ein, if you, Im Ein, if you don't do it, if you don't listen to me, Hashem, if you destroy the Jewish people because of the Chet HaEgel, Mecheni no Misifrecha. I want to have nothing to do with your Sefer. Exclude me. Take me out. Moshe Rabbeinu Sikin Atzmai Latovas Kol Yisrael. Do you know what Moshe Rabbeinu was? He was a leader. He put himself in danger for everybody. Even though that according to the way we would all think, according to logic, according to the, what the average person might imagine should be the approach of such a person, why should he pray for the sinners of the Egel? They just received the Torah and the Torah says, don't worship idols. They'd gone and they'd danced around this golden calf. That's not the way he thought. You know what? He's stuck in Moshe. He was a person who was willing to put his and stick his neck out. Even for a shoim. Even for them, even though it made no sense, whatever. He was willing to stick his neck out. Manhig Do you know what it means to be a leader of a generation? Do you know what it means to be a great leader? To be the mentor, the figure to whom everybody can show respect, to whom they can show love, to whom they can defer. Do you know what it means? Specifically, after Matan Torah, after we receive the Torah, let's take a look at Moshe Rabbeinu. He was someone who was a mistake in the man Klal Yisrael. The Liyot to me Klal. He never excluded anybody. He never said, you know, I'll, I'll dub him for you because you're a good bloke. But I'm not going to dub him for you because uh, you didn't keep Shabbos quite properly as I, I would have imagined you should. You didn't keep all the Chumras, you know, in the little the bits and pieces on the Noisa Kalim and the Shulchan Aruch, you didn't keep them all. There's a sack of the Mogan Avram you weren't to so Makbidon, and therefore I can't dub him for you. I'll dub him for that fellow because he seems to be a good fellow. He keeps all the mitzvahs properly. That's not the way, that's not the way he approached Klal Yisrael. Klal Yisrael is Klal Yisrael. It's everybody, it includes everybody. <laughs> makes no difference if it makes sense or doesn't make sense. Everybody, even a Russia, is worthy of the leader's attention. <laughs> He's not somebody who just huddles in an ark with his wife and children and takes care of himself and his family and says, you know, as long as we're saved, we're going to be okay. Who cares about anybody else? Let's not worry about anybody. Who cares about them? What difference does it make if they survive? They as long as I survive, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm wonderful. If I survive, I'm good. Oh, no, he said, You destroy everybody else, include me. I don't want to be involved. Do you know what a Roya Yisrael is? A shepherd, a true shepherd of the Jewish people. He is somebody who is willing to stick his neck out, to put himself at risk, actively, proactively, for the whole generation. Even the Doir HaMidbar, Shalem HaMerav HaKiva, your Rabbi Kiva says about them, it's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, Dav Kuvches. Rabbi Kiva says, that, and he was the greatest lover of the Jewish people. For He said, you know what? The Doir HaMidbar, they didn't really deserve because of all the Averis they did even after having received the Torah at Mount Sinai. But Moshe Rabbeinu was willing to do anything to protect them, to defend them, to make sure that they survived, that they saw another day and that they could be zoiche to whatever they could get and to eventually go into Eretz Yisrael. But Nisha Bamid Babiglal in fact we know, the Mepharshim tell us, Chazal tell us, that he stayed in the Midbar for them, with them. He could have decided, I'm not going to lead them. Told Rabbi Yisrael, I, mean, I don't have anything to do with them. He could have died. I mean, he was a man in his 80s, right? No, no. He needed to be the leader. He needed to continue to lead them and led them all the way through until they were ready 
to be taken into Eretz Yisrael. Now we can understand why Moshe Rabbeinu specifically davened for Yehoshua and not for the other Meraglim. Um, and why he davened for him specifically why he said, save Yehoshua from the Atsas Meraglim, which is a little obscure, it's a little opaque. It doesn't clearly tell you what the Meraglim, and, and clearly we know that Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't have imagined that the Meraglim would turn bad. But somehow he knew the Meraglim were not the right influence on Yehoshua. Somehow their derech wasn't the derech that he wanted for Yehoshua. What does it mean? Afshelem'an he didn't have him for the Meraglim. He didn't say the Meraglim should be whatever it is he wanted Yehoshua to be. He didn't change their names. He was concerned that something about the Meraglim would affect Yehoshua and that Yehoshua would not come back from this mission untainted by their influence. What was it? Says the Lubavitch Rebbe in Likut HaSichas, it's such a beautiful idea. Bachsidus, in Hasidic literature, the Hasidic idea is Musber Tam Lakach, Shamaraglim Lairatu Likonis Lert Israel. Do you know why the Maraglim didn't want to go into Eret Israel, into the land of Israel, into the promised land? Mishum Shalairatu Lis Asig Begashmi Soilam. Their whole raison d'etre, the underpinning of their approach was we don't want to be. In a material world. And if we go to Eretz Yisrael, we suddenly have to go into a material world. We have to be ordinary folk. You know what? In the Midbar, the Jewish people were not living in a material world. They were living in a bubble, in a cocoon. In a spiritual cocoon. The food that they ate was heavenly food. It was mon. The water that they drank was from a miraculous well, a spring of Miriam. They never had to wash their clothes, Chazal tell us, because they were cleansed by the holy clouds, the clouds of glory. There was no laundry. There was no need to concern yourself with food, with drink. And that's why they came back. They went to this country and they saw, you know, if we go there, no mon, no be'er Miriam. We're going to have to open laundries to clean our clothes. We're going to have to work the fields. We're going to have to be Zorea v'choyresh. We're going to have to be plowers and planters. We don't want to be plowers and planters. We want to devote our whole life to Torah, to spirituality. We don't want to be la'aseg b'charisha azuria. Okivnei adam choyshim b'zorim. We don't want to be like the ordinary folk of society of the world around us. We want to be excluded. We want to be like Rav Shimon by Yechai. Living in a cave. This cave was not a cave. But it was, it was like a spiritual oasis in the world. The Doi Hamidbar had this unbelievable opportunity to be completely porush separated from Olam Hazer. Aval Atzmam. When it comes to them, Yitochen Shizudar Toiva. When it comes to these Miraglim, these great people, these Anoshim, it makes perfect sense that that's what they would want for themselves. And that's a good thing. Kumiduba Le'el Sheish Tadikim Shanagosom Bekavagruis, there are such Tadikim who live in this rarefied atmosphere of spirituality. It's a wonderful idea. But for a leader of the generation to behave that way, that doesn't make any sense at all. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't suspicious that the Meraglim would go completely off the, off the reservation. But he knew what the way they were coming from. They would come back and say, mm, we're a little concerned because we'd like to remain like Rav Shem Bayachai in the, in the cave. He knew that that was a problem. He didn't think they'd come back and say terrible things about Eretz Yisrael, which they did and for which they were punished. But he knew that Yeshua is the future leader of the generation. Their approach mustn't be Yeshua's approach. He needed to be like Moshe Rabbeinu. kavonas dira yesh 
und eine Chisa lebayos hadoyer. In order to be a leader of the generation, in order to make sure that you are the best possible guide, the Roya Neman, like Moshe Rabbeinu was, you need to shrug off this idea that you need to live in, in a rarefied atmosphere, as a hermit, away from everybody else. You need to be deep in, you need to descend into the generation, live among ordinary people, talk about ordinary things with those people in the language that they understand, be able to handle the fact that not everybody is going to be a tzaddik. Not everybody is going to be at the level of kav hagavurais. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned for Yahushua. And that's why he said what he said to him. That's why he davened for him specifically. He knew that Yeshua was going to be the next leader. He knew exactly what was going to happen. How did he know? Share Eldad Umeidad, these two, these two uh, um, Navim, the prophets, and they were they were so, yeah, they were a little bit outside the system because they'd been chosen as prophets, but they decided not to go to the gathering and they started um, prophesying in the in the camp. And do you know what they said? They told everybody. They were, <laughs> they gave them this radical piece of news that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to die and Yeshua is going to be the leader. And suddenly Moshe knew that he was going to die and that Yeshua was going to inherit the mantle of leadership from him. And in order to be a leader, in order to be a Raya Nehmon, you have to be able to handle Klal Yisrael, everybody, to represent everybody. You don't want somebody who's a Noyach. You don't want somebody who's an Avram. You don't want someone who's a Shammai. You need someone who's a Moshe. You need someone who is a Hillel. Lokein, Lokein, his spalel olav, and that's why he davened for him. Koko Yoshi Acha, Meatzas Meraglin. Gam Besho, She, Ksherim Hoyu, even when they were, there was nothing wrong with them. You couldn't criticize, you can't criticize Shammai for being like he was. Made perfect sense. Why? The role of a leader of a generation is to devote himself, to devote themselves to everybody, those who are like him and those who are not. And how many leaders we have? I mean, obviously, this was written by the Lubavitcher Rebbe who epitomized this particular approach to Jewish leadership. And we know the leaders of the other type as well who live in their ivory tower, and it's not a criticism of them. But true leaders, leaders who make an impact on everyone, are people who are willing to get into the trenches. People who are willing to represent everybody and to be an influence, a positive influence, spiritual influence, religious influence, faith influence on everybody, whatever their level of Yiddishkeit, whatever their level of faith, whatever their level of observance. We'll leave it here. Thank you.